Hello and welcome to a special episode of Nothing But The Truth. And what makes this episode so particularly special, in fact, are my guests. They are two Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Jody Williams, who won the prize in 1997 for calling for a ban on landmines, and Shireen Ibadi, who won it in 2003 for her work in support of democracy, women's rights, and human rights in Iran. A very warm welcome to both of you. Jody Foster, you both have come to India mm -hmm. to greet the Dalai Lama on the 25th anniversary of his winning the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm curious, why was that so important? As we know, <clears throat> India is the country that has been most generous in its support of Tibetans from 59, when His Holiness led 80,000 Tibetans here. And <clears throat> China has put increasingly been putting pressure on governments to restrict his movement. We were all to go from here to South Africa for a Nobel summit. And for the third time in five years, South Africa refused to give him a visa to come to be with his Nobel colleagues. <clears throat> um, so coming here at this time on the heels of our protest and the cancellation of that summit is propitious. We did not know this would happen, but here we are, and we're showing support physically as well as morally. I want to ask you what, as a Peace Prize laureate yourself, you think of what South Africa has done. Presumably, this denial of a visa to the Dalai Lama has happened at the behest of China. Absolutely. And the World Summit of Nobel laureates that was going to happen in Cape Town has been cancelled. Correct. How upset are you by the South African government's behavior? <clears throat> Quite honestly, um, I'm not shocked at all. You expected it? I was shocked when they decided to hold it in Cape Town, given that they'd already denied him twice. So this was asking for trouble? This, in my view, was asking for trouble, yes. And it wasn't just that South Africa refused the visa. Publicly, China congratulated South Africa for its correct position for supporting Chinese sovereignty. Which should have embarrassed South Africa, but it didn't. Well, it has now. One of the things I've noticed, Ms. Abadi, is that one of South Africa's great Nobel Peace laureates, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who I would have thought would have spoken up and condemned and criticized his government, has kept completely silent. No. Um, At the beginning, it was the Nobel Women's Initiative who protested to the issue, and uh, it was the women who brought the issue up. And uh, Desmond Tutu later, he talked as well, and he stated his protest to the South African government. But he was very slow in making his protest known, wasn't he? I would like to say something about that. Go ahead. Because I was in constant communication with the Arch, all through the process of the backs and forths about how we together as Nobel laureates might address this issue. One thought was all of us descending on Cape Town and publicly protesting. And we thought that might work, but then when we considered it would be much more, uh, it'd be much better for us all if we just moved the summit. And His Holiness was in favor of moving the summit. And when that happened, we especially felt that going there and protesting would not work. The Archbishop <coughs> was in, communication with the office of the Tibetans as well, His Holiness, and with us. And I asked his feeling about what we were doing, and he said that the conference was doomed, the summit was doomed. But he was part of the host committee, and he held his voice until it was canceled, and then he spoke out. He felt that if he intervened because the South African government does not like him, it would be worse. But what you're also clearly suggesting is that Desmond Tutu, one of the most respected Nobel Peace laureates, could have spoken up earlier as a member of the host committee. He could have influenced the host committee. He should have protested within the host committee. He did. But silently and ineffectively. Well, I don't think this, honestly, this conversation should be an issue about Archbishop. No, I'm not. But I'm just simply pointing out that he could have been more effective and it seems he wasn't. I would not agree with you, but I don't think that's useful. I'd prefer that we talk about Tibetans and China and India and why we're here. We're not here about Absolutely. Archbishop but Tutu. Let me ask you this about Desmond Tutu. Are you a little disappointed? Because I've read quotations of yours in the paper where it seemed to me that you were disappointed <coughs> that he was slow to speak out. 
What counts is that we should be able to talk in loud voice and publicly to the governments. And I'm very glad that after our protest, he broke his silence and he spoke in a loud voice as well. All right, eventually he did speak, and that's the important thing. Let me talk a little about the two of you and the award that you've got. Jody Williams, you got your award in 1997 for your call to ban landmines. What drew you to this cause to begin with? Well, I have been an activist against war and U.S. foreign policy in particular since the Vietnam War. My first protest was against Vietnam. And I worked in the 1980s trying to stop U.S. intervention in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Out of that, I was actually invited to try to create an NGO political campaign to pressure governments to give up landmines. I thought it was a fabulous challenge. And within the space of five years, we went from six NGOs to 1,300 around the world, and we got a treaty to ban landmines. But are you also suggesting that answer that if you hadn't been invited to take up this cause, it was the rest wouldn't have happened? It was uh, Maybe somebody else would have. But uh, in your case, there was, was not on my mind. No. So I was there was thinking. an element of fortuitous good luck. Absolutely. Shreen Abadi, you got your award in 2002 <coughs> for, working, for working for the cause of democracy, women's rights, and human rights in Iran. How was your award received in your country? How did it take it? The government of Iran has always uh, censored me. When I won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, they took up silence, and it was never mentioned in Iran. But when the people protested, uh, the, there was a television program at 11 o'clock in the evening when no one was watching. It was in the news, and they just said one sentence, Shirin Abadi has won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, there are reports on the internet that in 2009, the Iranian authorities confiscated your award. Is that correct? Uh, well, uh, yes, in 2009, actually, a coup happened in Iran, and after that coup, uh, they attacked and raided my office, my NGO offices, and they, even my uh, house. And they confiscated all of my property, including the inheritance that I had received from my father. And since I was not in Iran, they arrested my sister and my husband. And they put them in prison for a while and put them under a lot of pressure. Now, I know also something else that happened in 2009. You chose to leave Iran. You now live in self-imposed exile in the United Kingdom. Is this the reason why, that you were virtually pushed out of your country because of the way they treated you, your sister and your husband? No, I was actually in Spain. I left one day prior to the elections to attend a seminar in Spain. And I was in Spain when coup happened and a number of my colleagues were arrested. I'm not scared of going to prison. I have been in prison before. But what counts is where can I be more useful for my country? Now, in that connection, there's something that I read in one of your profiles, Jody Williams, that struck my attention. And this is what it says. Williams believes that working for peace is not for the faint of heart. It requires dogged persistence. And I can certainly understand that when we hear what happened to Shreen Abadi, but can you explain a bit more what you mean about dogged persistence? Sure. I think that um, any fool, if you will, can pick up a gun and shoot somebody to try to bring about change, which is about gaining power through violence and the use of force. People like <coughs> Gandhi, like Martin Luther King, like His Holiness, who have chosen nonviolent resistance every single day are working at, against the power that keeps trying to crush the voice of nonviolence, the power that keeps trying to uh, give the impression that, you know, it's just tree-hugging liberals who believe in nonviolence and we don't really understand the world. I know that there's violence in the world, but we have choices about how we respond to that violence. If we respond with violence, what happens? Look at Gaza. Look at Gaza. It was, a it was a civilian population that suffered, not Hamas. But you're saying something very interesting. You're saying that to work for peace means that you not only have to be determined, mm -hmm. but at times you have to be obstinate, resilient, driven by passion. 
you are looking at two of the most obstinate, passionate, driven by passion women, you know, who've received And yet when Peace I look Prize. at the statistics <coughs> of the number of women who won the Nobel Peace yes. Prize in the 113 years of its existence, oh. there are just 15. Sexism. Literally. Literally. Between 1905, when the first woman received it, Berta von Suttner, and 1976, there were only f three. And then from 76 to now have been 12. Um, and I think it is in part because, you know, there, it's the change in the world and women being recognized as, you know, while men are waging war, women are the ones trying to keep the community together, trying to keep the children alive. Um, but the truth is, you're saying, is that the men who judge the award are sexist. They have chosen deliberately to overlook women. I don't think it's a deliberate choice. I think it's a global problem of men when they think about high positions or they think about awards and, or things of that nature. They look at other men they know. It takes a little bit of extra work which they're not prepared which to they're do. they're not prepared, but it's not just the Nobel Committee. Look at the UN. Shirin and I actually were in Hiroshima on a delegation, and we were addressed by a gentleman at the UN who was dealing with gender issues. I asked him if they had met their self-imposed goal of 10% women in you know, mid and high-ranking positions. He snorted and said, oh, we're not even at 3%. I said, why? He said, there are no qualified women. He had the nerve to say that in front of us. I said, I nominate Shirin for a job. <laughs> Ms. Abadi, you're not just the first Iranian to win the Nobel Peace Prize. You're the first Muslim woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Iran's a country that at the <coughs> moment intrigues the world. It's a country for many that disturbs them as well. How do you, as a Nobel Peace Laureate, but also as an Iranian, view the present political system in your country? Um, day by day, people are becoming more distant from their government. The government of Iran has two ways to uh, deal with the issue. It either has to change its position and come towards the people, or if it doesn't do that, then it will face the same thing that's happening in other countries in the region. The new president has not made, made that much of a difference at all. Uh, for example, I can say that the number of executions have increased and the violence of the government is still continuing. Uh, just this last week, a young man was executed and his charge was that he, has, he had questioned the fact that Jonah had lived in the whale's mouth for a period of time. And he had said in his interpretation that this could have only been symbolic. We need to find out why this was mentioned in the Quran. You know, just last week at the United Nations, the Iranian president as well as the Iranian ministers present claimed Iran was a democracy. You're saying to me, that is complete rubbish. Iran. The concept of the democracy depends on how you compare the countries uh, with each other. For example, if you compare Iran with Saudi Arabia, there is democracy in Iran. If you compare Iran with France, no, there is no democracy in Iran. Mr. Badi, in an interview that you gave in 2012, you said, and I'm quoting, Iran is the country with the most journalists in prison. This is the price people are paying. Is the situation getting worse? Or do you see a few signs of improvement on the horizon? I don't think this situation is getting any better. I think that the situation of human rights is actually worse. On top of the fact that the sanctions are putting a lot of people, pressure on people, and poverty is taking over. You know, a moment ago we were talking about whether the Iranian authorities are right or wrong in describing Iran as a democracy, and you very rightly said it depends upon what country you compare Iran to. In India, we have a democracy that is often flawed. There's a lot that's imperfect about our democracy. But the one thing that journalists like me can do is to sit in front of our prime minister and ask whatever we want. And sometimes, when he doesn't like the questions, he gets up and leaves. But journalists don't stop. And nothing happens to them 
after they've done that? Could such questions be asked of your politicians in Iran? Or would the journalist end up being executed? Journalists are very alone. There are many journalists in prison in Iran, and when Mr. Rouhani spoke and he said that no one is in prison in Iran because of his journalism in, in the interview that he had with CNN, 150 journalists wrote back uh, to him and said, we have been in prison, so what were we doing in prison? So in other words, to be a journalist in Iran is to be in a very dangerous profession? Yes. Uh, yes, journalists in Iran are always in danger and pursuant to a report of Journalists Without Borders, Iran is the worst country for journalists. Shreena Badi, Jody Williams, let's take a quick break at that point. When I come back, I want to raise two topical, but I promise you, controversial issues with you. And I'm not going to reveal what they are. Stick with me. After the break, you can discover for yourself. Welcome back to a special episode of Nothing But The Truth with two Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Jody Williams and Shireen Ebadi. Ms. Williams, let me raise the first of the two controversial issues that I promised I would. France disallows women from wearing the hijab, the chadar or the veil, even when the woman concerned wants to wear it. Now, is France right to do this or is this trespassing on the right of a woman to dress as she wants? I think it is a violation of her human rights. And I also really believe that the more you try to repress a people's culture, language, religion, the more pushback you're going to get. It may not be immediate, but it will happen. Um, I think it's a very wrong-headed decision. Isn't this an instance of a culture where male dominance or convention is imposing upon women something that men believe is correct because they believe, and I would add wrongly, that women need to be protected despite the fact the woman concerned may want to show her face, may want to be, show her hairstyle, may want to show her hands and her feet, and she has the right to. So is this a culture or is this male dominance that we're talking about? I'll let Shirin answer that, but I want to say it's, it's patriarchy everywhere. It's a, you know, that culture and that tradition's expression of sexism and patriarchy. It is done in different ways in different countries, but the, the male-dominated framework persists everywhere. And that's what women are struggling against. And by the way, we don't need to be protected. What we need is to have recognition that we are equal under the law, period. So if the French say the law in France is that no one can wear a hijab or a chadar or a veil in public, is that law wrong or is it right? It's wrong. Look at all the incorrect laws under the Nazi regime. You can write law that does not make it truth, justice, equality. Shireen Ibadi, in your country, women are required to cover their heads, maybe just with a scarf, maybe sometimes with a chadar, maybe with a veil. Is this something that they are willingly and voluntarily doing because they want to, or are they doing it because convention and male dominance or the pressure of mullahs requires them to do it? Um, in this is the government that is imposing hijab on women, and women uh, take advantage of every opportunity to pr uh, prove that they're against hijab. And I'm sure that uh, you watched uh, the program during which I received the Nobel Peace Prize. I was not wearing a hijab, and the reason I did that was that women in Iran are against imposed hijab. In which case, I want to ask you the same question I put to Jody Williams. Is France right to create a rule which says in public women will not wear the hijab, will not wear the veil, or is France wrong to create that rule? In some countries, like Islamic countries, they impose hijab on women. In some European countries, like France, they don't let women wear a hijab. Why is it that we don't let the women decide for themselves? 
In other words, there shouldn't be a law on the matter. Each woman should do what she wants. Yes. Yes, it's upon the women to determine freely what they want to wear, like what you guys do, and you determine what you want to wear. Let me come to the second, what I believe is topical but controversial issue. Srinabadi, in a country like India, Muslim men are permitted to have four wives. The state believes that it would be wrong for the state to intervene in what the state views as their Islamic practice. But there are many Muslim countries where, in fact, polygamy is considered completely and simply wrong. Where do you stand on the issue of polygamy? Should a man, because his faith permits it, be permitted to have four wives simultaneously? Or is polygamy wrong? Uh, I am against polygamy in general. Maybe at the beginning, when Islam took over, the conditions were such that it was, would have been acceptable. But now the conditions do not call for that. Many rules and principles were, were accepted in, or have been accepted in religions in the past. But that doesn't mean that they could be enforced today. For example, slavery was accepted in Islam, but that doesn't mean that today we can justify slavery. Tony Williams, do you think polygamy is an issue on which Nobel Peace Laureates should raise their voice in protest and criticism? Or would you be infringing upon the rights of individuals to decide for themselves? No, like Sharon, I do not agree with polygamy. Polygamy is the result of men having written all of those religious books. I can assure you, had women written them, we would not be offering ourselves, you know, in multiple numbers to a man. I think that the hardest thing in dealing with human rights issues when religion and culture is inserted as a reason to violate rights is it, it becomes conflated and very difficult to just have a conversation about what human rights are. Connected with the issue of polygamy mm. is the question of how men treat women, discrimination against women. Today, politicians lay a lot of stress on what they call the rights of the girl child. Mm. But societies, often world over, but more often than not in third world countries, discriminate against their daughters. Mm. They're biased in favor of their sons. In India, little mm. boys are brought up as gods. Daughters are thought of as a curse. Mm. How strongly do you think this is an issue that women Nobel laureates like yourself should speak out against? We do. That is one issue that we work on. We work on violence against women, uh, launching a campaign in 2012 to stop <coughs> um, sexual violence in conflict against women. The point that we stress, however, is that we chose the word conflict purposefully because conflict isn't just war. Conflict can be societal conflict, right? Now, throughout Central America and Mexico, there's huge conflict. It's not declared war. And, and we believe, really, that in order to address the sexism, in order to really advance women's education, in order to stop violence against women, you have to push for women's human rights. And, you know, governments are great at talking, no offense to the governments in question. And them. Governments say lots of lovely things. They write lots of lovely laws. There are brilliant resolutions at the UN. They're absolutely positively irrelevant if they are not written into domestic law and enforced. But can you change the way women are regarded, discriminated against mm -hmm. simply by creating laws? Do you not need to change mindsets? And mindsets are perhaps the most difficult thing to change. Well, Sharin noted slavery. Right after the end of slavery in my country, uh, the white people didn't suddenly embrace African Americans. It, but the law made them equal. And over time, things have changed. Not enough, but they've changed. Sharina Badi and Jody Williams, a Thank pleasure you. speaking to both of you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.